we've never been here before. And that's the other reason why I didn't, you say, hand off to another generation. I've got to finish this job. I've got to finish this job because there's so much at stake. Last night, all eyes were on President Biden during his press conference at the NATO summit in Washington. During his 59 minutes on stage, the president fought to ease Democratic concerns that he's no longer a viable candidate in the 2024 presidential election. Although he made a few gaffes, including mistakenly calling Kamala Harris Vice President Trump, Biden argued his successful first term in office and his decades-long career in Washington make him the top candidate to handle complex issues domestically and worldwide. The press conference turned into a round of questioning on his ability to stay in the race during a back and forth with reporters who pressed Biden with questions on his decision not to withdraw from the 2024 election. But was Biden's press conference enough to ease concerns surrounding his age and mental acuity? Joining me now is The Hill's senior political correspondent, Amy Parnes. Amy, it's great to see you. This was clearly a make or break moment for President Biden. And although he mostly stood his ground, he made a few gaffes. Do you think Biden was able to quell concerns with his performance and buy himself potentially more time? able to buy himself a little bit of time, Julia. I think what I'm hearing from strategists post uh, presidential, I mean, post um, press conference is that he was able to live another day is how another um, strategist put it. So I think he was able to quell some of the concerns, but temporarily, I think that you're still seeing this drip, drip, drip of uh, lawmakers coming out. Um, people are still very apprehensive behind the scenes. I'm still hearing from a lot of people um, almost every hour, um, you know, donors, lawmakers, aides, people close to the campaign, surrogates. No one feels like it's enough at the moment. And the president obviously needs to continue to be seen, to continue to campaign, to continue to push back um, on some of these narratives that have played out. But I, I think that um, a lot of people see this as um, not great at the moment and not uh, a um, uh, the, the best place for him to be at the start of the Republican National Convention. Yeah, someone phrased it to me. It's just really hard to put the toothpaste back into the tube in this situation. So we know that at least three more House Democrats called on Biden to drop out of the presidential race after that solo news conference. Were there decisions made prior to his speech? And with the total number of House Democrats calling on him to step down at 17 at the time of this recording, will he be able to ever regain their support? I kept hearing all week, Julia, that a lot of people were holding fire or holding back fire rather because of NATO. They did not want to be disrespectful to the president. A lot of Democrats made that known to me that he was almost buying himself more time this week because of that fact that people didn't want to step on him while he was hosting foreign leaders here. So I'm hearing from sources that more are to come, that there are more lawmakers that will come out. Three just came out, as you mentioned. But um, I think that they, they wanted this week to pass and this moment to pass. And they wanted to see that he was proving himself last night. And I think there are still a lot of questions about whether um, he could still run this campaign, win the campaign, and then, of course, go on to serve another four years. So former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made news this week after saying it's up to Biden to decide if he stays in the race. And there are reports that uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has held private conversations and has said that he has doubts that the president can beat former President Trump. What's the latest on what you've been hearing from Pelosi and Schumer world? The thing is people close to them tell me that there is still a lot of consternation and worry about how this all plays out. And they are watching, they're watching what their members are saying. They're watching um, what polls are, are gonna dictate in the coming days. Um, if people are voicing more concern, if they feel like some of these down ballot races are going to be tighter and they could potentially lose, I think that's when you're gonna start to hear more, especially from the upper chamber, which has been relatively quiet. I think 
think Biden is kind of counting on his former home in the upper chamber in the Senate to kind of hold uh, with the exception of a couple of people. But I think, you know, and they felt really good coming out of that meeting. Of course, he sent some of his aides yesterday to talk to senators and their aides, and they felt really good coming out of that meeting. Um, but it remains to be seen if Biden, you know, everything will be under a microscope right now. And so if he has another big stumble, if people still think that they're, um, that he, you know, that he can change, um, you know, that he can shift where the down ballot is, I think you're going to start to hear more, um, you're going to see a lot of senators uh, in particular be a little more vocal. And over in the lower chamber, House Democrats met this week to discuss growing concerns over Biden's 2024 chances. And House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries privately met with the president. What came out of their meeting? I think that there, there's sort of a wait and see approach right now. I think uh, Jeffries wanted his members at the time to feel like he, they were being seen and heard. Um, and he wanted to express to the president what he had been hearing. Once again, I think if there is a flood of Democrats that come out in the House, I think this all changes. I think that Jeffries has held his, um, his cards close to the vest. He doesn't want to, um, you know, signal that he he is kind of pushing the president out. But I'm, I'm, I think that he's really taking um, into account what his members are telling him. And if it continues to be bad, then I think you'll continue to see them meet and talk and talk this through. Of course, the president last night was saying none of this, you know, the polls aren't showing any of this. And this is all being kind of over dramatized. So I wonder um, how they would see this if the polls do start to shift a little further. No, definitely. That is interesting. And one of the other things that Biden said last night is he obviously reiterated that he wouldn't step down. But I thought it was interesting. His messaging was much softer on the topic as it, you know, compared to what it was in the past. I mean, when answering a question, he said he will step down only if he knows he no longer has a chance of winning. I mean, during the Stephanopoulos interview and, you know, in his campaign rallies, he wasn't even, he didn't seem to be even going there, but now he seems to at least be acknowledging that it could be a possibility while at the same time saying, but it's not going to happen. What is the reaction to that new messaging? And was does this represent a bigger shift that Biden is now considering potentially, you know, acknowledging the idea of dropping out of the race? Yeah, I think his remarks with uh, George Stephanopoulos took a lot of Democrats, particularly lawmakers. It, t it took them aback a little bit, and they couldn't believe um, that he was so staunch and that he was really digging in. And they kind of found that offensive. A lot of people were telling me that it, he wasn't really reading the room. And so I think that these remarks kind of were reflective of that, that he wanted to give a nod to these people that were feeling some worry and didn't want to seem so assertive and so defiant. Um, so I think that was very intentional. But, you know, then again, Julia, he pushed back and said, um, these polls aren't showing me this. Um, so he's giving himself some room to, to kind of defend himself, to say that, you know, he can go on to live another day, that he can prove that, you know, like the Washington Post poll indicated yesterday, that things are in a dead heat and that he can win. Um, and I think privately, what he has told people for months is that he is the only one who can win. And you, you saw the New York Times report yesterday that said that they are internally checking on whether someone like Kamala Harris, how she fares against Donald Trump. Um, so they are kind of taking those precautions. But I think internally, I think privately, he still remains, he's still convinced that he's the only one who can win and points to 2020 as his big proof of that. <laughs> Well, we'll be keeping an eye on this as the story develops. It seems like there's a new twist and turn every day. So thank you so much, Amy Parnes, for keeping us up to date. Come back soon. Thanks, Julia. President Biden has lost support from a growing number of Democrats, and now Hollywood is flipping the script. 
once loyal celebrities are rewriting their stance on Biden's chances this election. This week, loyal Democrat and one of Biden's most high-profile do donors, George Clooney, joined Democratic lawmakers in calling for the president to drop out. Clooney's call in a New York Times op-ed came one month after he helped raise nearly $30 million for Biden in a star-studded Los Angeles fundraiser. Is Clooney sending a signal to other major Democratic donors? Joining me now is my good friend, The Hill's national political reporter and author of The 1230 Report, Kate Martell. Kate, it's so good to see you. You know, if you're a Democrat running for office, particularly a federal office or pr the presidency, it's not a good sign when Hollywood begins to turn on you. This week, Clooney wrote in that New York Times op-ed that he no longer believes President Biden stands a chance and he essentially needs to step down. What are other Hollywood A-listers uh, saying uh, in turning on the president? Yeah, what a powerful message from actor George Clooney this week. Um, as you mentioned, he had a major fundraiser for President Biden just last month where they raised $30 million. So if that gives you an idea of how much he supports Biden and how much that must have taken for him to switch the script on him. And, you know, we've now seen almost the floodgates open a bit for Hollywood elites. These President Biden has really seemed to have find a tidal wave of criticism in the aftermath of this debate. And now we're seeing a lot of Hollywood stars now come out against him. You know, uh, filmmaker Rob Reiner, he's a fierce Trump critic and he echoed Clooney's message. We've also seen actors like Michael Douglas and John Cusack also come out in support of another Democratic nominee. Also, Abigail Disney, the heiress to um, to Disney, it also came out and said that she has the same type of feeling. So, you know, overall, by seeing some of these Hollywood elites turning on Biden, it's really a, a bad look for him. And it's, I think, a message that is resonating with people outside of Washington that so far we've only really been hearing mostly from politicians and people within the Beltway. And this, I think, shows when you step back from the Beltway that people, even Hollywood elites, have this type of message and this type of sentiment towards President Biden. Right, right. And we know that Hollywood is obviously a major fundraising tool for Democrats in particular. And we, just as I mentioned before, Clooney held that fundraiser in Los Angeles alongside Julia Roberts, bringing in over $30 million for Biden. So if these Hollywood elites are essentially turning their backs on the president, how much of an impact could this have on the Biden campaign? You know, I think I look at this as not as much of a Hollywood thing, but a money thing. I mean, these are some pretty big donors. They are big donors. And obviously the optics in this are not great for President Biden to see some of these supporters who have been very vocal supporters of President Biden to turn on him is you know not a great look but let's remove optics from all of this this is a fundraising game and you know just in june the biden campaign raised 127 million dollars they have about 240 million dollars cash on hand now compare that to former president trump's campaign he has about 284 million dollars cash on hand and in the fall in the, following the debate he actually has raised more than $30 million, almost effectively canceling out what Biden raised at that major fundraiser that, you know, you start to look and these campaigns are really expensive and you can start to deplete some of these um, these cash numbers that you start to have in the bank. And so after a while, this is really a big fundraising game. This is going to be a big summer, particularly when Democrats leave Washington in August and they head out on the campaign trail. There are a lot of major donors and major fundraisers. And when a lot of these major donors are hesitant and concerned that they don't think that President Biden will necessarily win in November, that can have trickle down effects on some of these down ballot races as well as President Biden's campaign. So, you know, we talk about the optics of this Hollywood almost turning on Biden, but I think what's even more important is this fundraising because President Biden really does need to be able to keep up with former President Trump's campaign. And these campaigns, as you know, Julia, are very expensive to run in this day and age. You know, it's interesting because former Obama officials and people in President Obama's, you know, inner circle or his orbit when he was president 
have been also calling on Biden to step down. Uh, David Axelrod is one of those figures, and also uh, the former Obama aides who host the very popular podcast Pod Save America have grown very skeptical of Biden's chances, and they're calling on him to step down. What kind of influence do they have, and what are they saying? I know that there's new reporting out today that suggests that Nancy Pelosi has been talking with Barack Obama himself behind closed doors about all of this. These are really big names that you're bringing up, Julia. And I would argue that former President Obama is, I would say, the most influential Democrat right now in you know, what President Biden does. And there's been you know, some interesting reporting that President Obama reportedly knew that George Clooney's op-ed was coming out on Wednesday. And while he didn't tell him what to write or encourage him to write it, he also didn't try to stop it. So when you look at some of these Biden advisors or these Obama advisors, in this podcast and more broadly and how they're starting to turn on Biden and really think that he should not be at the top of the ticket, they have huge sway, you know, aside from just having an ear with former President Obama and Democrats more broadly, they also have a lot of experience both on the campaign trail and in the White House. And they know how grueling and taxing both of those roles are and what comes with it. So they carry, you know, this huge influence, even aside from the fact that they're Democratic strategists and former Obama aides. But not only do they have an ear with Obama, they also at the same time have really influential perspectives that Democrats more broadly are listening to. And like you mentioned, for former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, to also behind the scenes try to persuade President Biden to step down. That's also the other ba major name that you have to talk about is Obama and Pelosi, I think are probably two of the most influential figures when it comes to this. And while Pelosi publicly has said, you know, I defer to Biden is whatever his decision is and I'll support him, you know, behind the scenes, we're hearing that there's actually much more to that story. And combined with the fact that Obama reportedly knew about George Clooney's op-ed, all of this together just makes a lot of really increasing pressure for President Biden. CNN's Jake Tapper took to social media, I guess turning to the RFK beat. He was calling on RFK Jr.'s campaign to remove an ad that manipulated footage from news clips. What was in the ad and how was it shaped to change the narrative from the news broadcasts? You know, it was an ad that really did seem to frustrate a lot in the media. Um, RFK's campaign posted this ad, like you mentioned, where they manipulated some news footage to make it look like certain news figures were boosting his candidacy in a way that they argued they were not. That some of this was edited footage that included Dana Bash, Jake Tapper, and MSNBC's Joy Reid. And, you know, using their footage to make it look like they were talking about RFK's campaign in a way that they argue was not necessarily the case. So as you mentioned, CNN Jake's Tapper took to social media and said that, hey, this is not what I meant at all. This is not what we meant at all and called it both misleading and deceptive. So uh, turning to Democrats and how they're approaching uh, this very brutal news cycle for them, Project 2025 has gained national attention recently and now the Democratic National Committee is rolling out its first paid media campaign linking former President Trump to the 900-page conservative go governing agenda. How are Democrats otherwise working to link Trump to the Project 2025? I know that Trump is very much trying to distance himself from it. Trump's MO right now is to keep his distance as much as he can to this 900-page conservative manifesto. Some of the pro policy proposals in this policy memo are fairly controversial, and that is why Trump wants to keep stay away from it as much as possible, even though there is a CNN report that many of the authors behind this were actually worked for Trump, more than 140, I believe, from that CNN report. Um, and, you know, you look at this more broadly, it's, it's fascinating, this Project 2025, that Trump is trying to keep his distance from it. And Democrats are really trying to really do see this massive opportunity here by taking some of the controversial proposals relating to abortion, even criminalizing pornography is something that had been mentioned in this in this report. Um, and you using this against them, you know, there were some billboards that are going up in major battleground cities 
over the next few weeks that are linking Trump's quote over and over, I'll be a dictator on day one, but nothing after. That's a quote that Democrats see as being really effective on the campaign trail, and they're blasting this on billboards. They're also taking from Project 2025 and linking to some of the abortion restrictions. Abortion, more broadly, is fairly popular among the American public and the support for women's reproductive rights. So, you know, I do think that using those policy proposals against them that I think the Democrats are realizing this is something we need to lean into. And that's why we saw the DNC put money into some of these billboards and try to build on this Project 2025 as Trump tries to keep his fingerprints off it as much as possible. So this is all coming as we're days away from the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee and speculation is continuing to swirl around who President Trump will pick as his running mate. We know the top three contenders are Florida Senator Marco Rubio, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance and North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. You know, from what the sense I get, Kate, it seems like Rubio is a bit of a favorite. I hear Vance sometimes mixed in there, but the people I've chatted with have been pointing more towards Rubio. But is there a chance he could survive, surprise everyone and reveal his pick at a rally he's holding in Pennsylvania this weekend? Or is he going to do it uh, later at the convention? I agree with your assessment of those top three, but I think there's also nothing that Trump loves more than this media speculation. It's almost a competition, you know, a sporting event of guessing who the final pick will be. And for him to wait until the Republican National Convention, it just continues to build and it will make the RNC even more newsy. So to answer your question, yes, there's always a chance. Um, Trump, you know, likes to have the surprise factor. So he certainly could make this announcement earlier than the RNC. But, you know, the way that he's run his campaign, everything we know about the former president, I would be pretty surprised if he didn't hold off until next week because, you know, he wants to be able to have this media buildup. He has mostly stayed pretty quiet since the last debate because all of the media attention has been on President Biden and his health. So this has been something that we've seen him kind of ramp up over the past few days and start, we've seen Trump start talking about this VP speculation again, even having Marco Rubio attend an event in Florida earlier this week and, you know, tease him a bit about whether or not he would be the VP pick. So I personally think it'll be next week, but you know, we're, we can all historically be wrong about these things. So um, right, who knows? Right. So, so we know Trump's deep stakes contender, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, has previously applauded the overturning of Roe versus Wade. But he has shifted his stance, aligning more closely with Trump's messaging on the issue. Do you think this is an overall change in how Republicans are working to adjust their messaging? Or is this seen as a bit of a political ploy to make him a better VP candidate and someone could, who could appeal to maybe a broader swath? of voters. Julie, I think it could be honestly a little bit of both that both for J.D. Vance to be the top three when it comes down to finalists for Trump's VP pick. That is something that, like we mentioned earlier, that women's reproductive rights is a really important issue to voters. And while Senator J.D. Vance has not necessarily supported some of the exceptions for rape and incest in the past, he has started to shift his stance further and further into praising what pr Trump feels about abortion and that it should be a state's rights issue and you know supporting some of these exceptions. So I, I think that while you know this is something that the Republican Party is grappling with because of some of the polling that reflects um, the Americans' perception of reproductive rights, at the same time also, if J.D. Vance were to test something, test out a new you know, a new stance where he can soften his issue, his stance just a little bit more, it's excellent timing. So I, I don't think it's quite one or the other, but I think playing hand in hand, it's excellent timing for Senator Vance to praise Trump's stance in any way he can. But also Republicans are probably also behind the scenes figuring out where they can go forward with abortion and how they can frame it in a way that they can bring in more voters, particularly at a time when voters are not happy with the top of the Democratic ticket. And, you know, I think they're thinking that maybe they could peel off some independent voters, depending on how they phrase it. Right, right. Definitely a very, um, you know, tough issue for Republicans. So we'll see how they change their messaging or their messaging evolves. So, Kate, on a lighter note, before I let you go, there's a little something you've been working on that is launching today. Tell me about this new political news quiz game you've been working on in your newsletter. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so one of my colleagues, Sirakshi at the Hill, and I have been working on this politics quiz. Basically, if you think you follow political news and you're a news junkie, let's test it out and let's see how much you actually have been following this week when we get into the weeds, particularly with DC insider questions. So I, I figured if you're up for it, I have a question that I can test you yeah. on, Julia. Fire away. Okay. So, so Julia, why did Congresswoman Mary Peltola of Alaska miss House votes this week? Was her flight canceled? She Did she have a doctor's appointment that she couldn't miss? She had to harvest her family's blueberry bushes. She had to prepare fish for the winter. Or did she have to see a close family friend off before they left for Paris to compete in the Olympics? Okay, I'm going to guess <laughs> her flight was canceled. That was a good guess. It's actually <laughs> that she is staying in Alaska this week to prepare fish for the winter. That is something that her family does every year. They collect a lot of fish, they freeze them and get ready for the next winter. Um, so I, you know, I would have guessed the flight canceling too, had I not known what it was, but she is even advocating posting on social media about how important fisheries are. And if you check out her social media, there are photos of her fishing this week. So um, pretty good. Pretty good, interesting tidbit, huh? <laughs> I love that. I would have, well, I guess that makes sense coming from Alaska, and it's great that she's drawing attention to that and, you know, that practice she does. That's that's awesome. Good for her. Very good for her. And good for yeah. you, Kate. And thank you so much for, you know, coming on to talk uh, and share this quiz. Um, and make sure you subscribe to Kate's 1230 report and sign up for the Hill's politics quiz on thehill.com. Kate, as always, thank you for joining. Thanks so much, Julia. Experts are calling attention to the Supreme Court sidestepping notable social media issues last term. The high court avoided major questions involving the Internet, despite their docket, including a handful of cases on curbing misinformation online and content moderation. Those cases had the potential to transform how social media is regulated and its relationship with the First Amendment, according to the Knight First Amendment is Institute. Experts are saying the court chose to be mild. The high court on its final day threw out the lower court rulings to bar social media companies from banning users for their political views, punting a major First Amendment challenge down the road. The Supreme Court will begin its next term the first Monday of October. Georgia Senator John Ossoff is breaking from the majority and voting with the GOP. The Democrats sided with Republicans to block the nomination of Judge Sarah Netburn, who has been in the limelight over a controversial ruling to transfer a transgender woman convicted of sex crimes to, federal women, to a federal women's prison. The vote marks an uncommon case of, Democrat, of a Democrat breaking with their party to stamp out a Biden nomination in committee. Ossoff's vote is the only no vote cast against a judicial nominee by a Democratic senator on the Judiciary Committee since Biden became president. Congress's purse straps remain tightened, at least for now, as a GOP bill to fund the legislative branch has failed on the House floor. Ten House Republicans joined Democrats to sink a GOP-led bill to fund Congress for, for 2025. The bill failed 205 to 213, with three Democrats voting in favor of it. The vote could torpedo the party's goals to pass all 12 annual funding bills by August recess. House Republicans are expected to vote on the last seven bills after the RNC in Milwaukee next week. That's it for today's Daily Debrief. I'm Julia Manchester. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.